Right, good evening everybody. Welcome to the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation. Um, I'm Jason James, and I'm just going to do the housekeeping announcements because somebody else is chairing this evening. So, and the housekeeping announcements are, um, firstly, if the fire alarm should go off, please don't use the lift. And you have to go down the stairs, two doors down, out the front door, and we should congregate on the park side of the street. Um, and the other thing is, please don't leave any valuables in our cloakrooms because nobody is watching them. So we've got um, a cast of thousands this <laughs> evening. Um, so I'd better uh, give the podium up to someone else quickly. But um, our chair this evening is Neil Munro, Dr. Neil Munro, who is senior lecturer in American literature and director of the. Oxford Brooks Poetry Centre. So obviously you're a, an American specialist, but um, it's a bit of a walk on the wild side uh, <laughs> this evening. So I'll, I'll pass over straight away. Thank you very much. Um, so are you going to want to? I will well, try to do my little thing. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I'd like to extend particular thanks to Jason and to Shihoko for uh, allowing us to come in and speak to you about the exhibition. In fact, I'm not really going to do any speaking at all. Uh, I'm just going to pass it over to, to these three. Um, but I will say a few things about um, the Poetry Centre, if I may, the Oxford Brooks Poetry Centre, um, which we are kind of coordinating the exhibition uh, sketches from the Poem Road at the Glass Tank, which is the exhibition space at Oxford Brooks University, which has just started um, and will be running until the 15th of July. So hopefully some of you uh, may get the chance to see it. Um, the Poetry Centre, uh, which is based at Oxford Brooks, began life in 1998 uh, and is based within the Department of English and Modern Languages, um, in, in which uh, Natalie Aubert is, uh, is based as well. It hosts an annual programme of events uh, for academics, students and the general public, which includes conferences, research seminars, uh, workshops, exhibitions like this one, poetry readings and community projects, as well as producing a whole range of uh, internationally recognised research uh, in all kinds of poetry. Our recent work has also included projects with refugees and asylum seekers, uh, and also with local young people through the Oxford City Poet, who was Kate Clanchy until recently, uh, a post the, the Poetry Centre created. Uh, we might also run an international poetry competition, which um, is currently open for entries, so if anybody fancies entering, please go ahead. Uh, it has both an open category and an English as a second language category. There's lots of information about the Poetry Centre on the website, so I would uh, encourage you to go and uh, have a look at it. Um, tonight what we've done is we've brought together the two artists, Isal and Chris, who are involved in the exhibition, um, whose then the collaborative exhibition Sketches from the Poem Road is, is as I say, on Oxford Brooks, and also Natalie Aubert, um, whose work on uh, Christian Dautomont the Belgian surrealist has some very fascinating parallels, I think, between um, the work which uh, Isao and Chris have done with Basho um, and uh, the kind of the Belgian connection as well. Isao has translated, in many respects, Basho's texts into textures, uh, and Dautomont has a kind of similar uh, frame of mind when it comes to looking at his art. Uh, in particular, the, the very interesting tension between the visual and the verbal and uh, the way in which ideas and emotions are expressed uh, in those ways. Um, so what I'll do is I'll introduce uh, Isao, uh, Chris, and Natalie all together, I think, and then Isao, and the plan is Isao and Chris are going to sort of talk. Um, most, of, uh, most of the time, Isao will be sort of leading you through the way he has created the exhibition through a lot of the slides here. Uh, they'll speak for about 15 minutes about their collaboration, the inspiration of Basho's Narrow Road to the Deep North, and the work that's in the exhibition itself. And then Natalie will talk for a bit about her work on Christian Dautomont um, for about another 15 minutes. Then we'll have a brief discussion between the panellists to forge some of these connections and then open it up to you for questions. So um, let me begin by introducing Isao and Chris. Isao Miura is a, a London-based painter and sculptor from Akita Prefecture. He studied at Chelsea College of Art and the Royal College of Art in London. He's exhibited widely in Japan, Europe, UK and the USA. And in 2014-15, uh, he was awarded a fellowship in the Bronze Foundry at the Chelsea College of Art in order to develop this project, uh, translating Basho's masterpiece, The Narrow Road to the Deep North, through visual images. Uh, the book which he and Chris produced, Sketches from the Poem Road, was recently shortlisted for the Ted Hughes Award. That's the one, the orange one. Uh, for, for sale, <laughs> just in case you want to buy one, there they are at the front. Um, it was shortlisted for the Ted Hughes Award for New Work in Poetry. Chris Beckett is a poet and translator who lived in Tokyo in the early 1980s. Uh, he won the Poetry London competition in 2001, and his latest poetry collection, which is called Ethiopia Boy, was published by Carcanet Oxford Poets in 2013. 
He's written a series of poems, sketches, which accompany uh, Isal's work, uh, some of which are included in the Orange Book at the front. Um, and also, he's, especially for this particular sort of version of the exhibition, because it was previously on at the Poetry Society, the one at Brooks, though, has a 15-metre, one-line poem in the voice of an inkbrush, uh, about which you'll hear more in a moment. Um, so perhaps I'll hand it over to you two, and then I'll introduce Natalie afterwards. So would you like to come and explain about the exhibition? I'm Lisa Hira. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, this, uh, my project started three years ago, and suddenly I felt uh, needing to uh, translate uh, not all the author in the English, and something, maybe I, I'm not an English, but I may be translated in different media, different texture, maybe uh, connected to uh, audience to some different point of view. That, that's simply the reason I started. Then, this is a uh, departure, and uh, one of the famous what Naruto Oku uh, haiku, Yukoharu ya Torinaki wo no neonamida. That is the first uh, my uh, scruple. That's right, like that. Then, and then the different uh, view uh, pointed. Uh, this is almost always like I want to see something more story, uh, like um, also same time three dimensional work. You have to only one point of view. You have to look around. That means I think kind of journey to look walk through. Then you under, you change your angle. Then you understand something you find new and uh, your point of view. Can you say something more about the image itself? Oh, okay. Um, this is about a uh, shape coming about Yukoharu ya Torinaki wo no mea namida, namida the tears. I think this haiku, uh, most uh, tears, is the most key uh, about issue. Also, what uh, Basho felt very sad about it, leaving friends, leaving Edo, and also surrounding about spring, also leaving too. The first kind of element, a tear, a tear drop is a present, symbolized the haiku. Therefore, maybe making something to the dimension, I think what tear drop shape, maybe to connect it to viewers. Therefore, also plus, and like mirror, tears reflect surrounding such uh, birds or uh, also fish inside the tears. Mm -hmm. Also, same time, Basho, this very sad moment, but have to get out of the sad moment. Otherwise, it comes to, to the journey. Then the journey starts throwing <laughs> the tears out of the tears, then start leave left and uh, Edo. Yeah. Well, this is uh, uh, well, the first one that uh, work on paper. This is, I felt it's not good enough to make three dimensional work. I actually made three dimensions of uh, plaster. Then I draw this is my image as much as possible. This is a, yeah. So you can see all the drawings in the background there, which then translate into the paper, into the plaster. Well, this is in Chelsea and uh, studio, Foundry Studio. Then that uh, gray was three dimensional work. This is a synthetic, I use synthetic uh, clay. This quite uh, make quite fine detail to texture, uh, but usually what uh, clay is quite coarse, therefore quite difficult to make fine texture. Therefore, I made that uh, use the synthetic clay. Then after that, we covered uh, what uh, silicon, so that the awful color, but pink <laughs> silicon cover made the mold. Then after that, uh, what uh, silicon is very uh, fragile. They have to cover it again with clay. This this kind of process, I saw also a uh, uh, translating process. I take like that. Then this is what after that uh, laid inside laid uh, wax, and then both two two to come together. Then after take off, then coming like sort of bluey green. Uh, uh, 
wax uh, three dimension, but inside uh, uh, you can see base, some of the plaster, very coarse one. This is quite uh, special about uh, plaster, uh, quite the resist and uh, temperature. I think maybe more than 800 or 900, they resist, uh, they're quite strong. Then after we make a uh, sort of like of the shape of the stick, that's called lana. Means uh, when you pour the uh, bronze, melted bronze, they have to run nicely, it's all covered everywhere. Then we change upside down, they made all sort of a structure covered again, same uh, special word, clay. Then that uh, top of the you see a uh, coffee cup. Coffee cup. <laughs> that also covered same plaster again. That coffee cup, and after that, we all put in the kiln, mm -hmm. and then sort of more than 24 hours, and uh, burned on inside of uh, wax. This is a lost wax process. Therefore, and after that, uh, inside have hollow, based thin sort of a quarter inch uh, space. That space we filled up in the melted bronze, we just doing it like that. That's a very dangerous business. <laughs> I didn't do that because <laughs> as a technician, carefully. <laughs> then after that, uh, sort of 24 hours later, the touch to look warm, they take off all uh, plaster, they're coming like sort of a chicken carcass or like. <laughs> but then, well, this is a stick, also uh, we uh, struck it. Then after that, it cut all uh, the stick. Then you can see mark, a uh, yellow but bronze mark. That is the sort of what we cut off. Then after, they cleaned. But could you back again? <laughs> but this, uh, I believe that uh, poured but, uh, bronze, maybe I feel that that's finished. No, it's just only maybe half you finish that sort of bronze process. Then after that, uh, cleaned, then uh, all the wells in the hole, sometimes we make hole, then uh, because a uh, hole in space in between. Then after that, uh, this is about black uh, patination. And then after I made lots of frames, so sort of about um, like, is it like, so sort of, yes, making frames, a huge frame temperature. Then use about acid chemical, then make the black pattern. Then after I set uh, finish the color, I yes I like it. Then I take off surface again and, and stripped on the black part, come so bronze bare sort of bronze texture that come out. This this is sort of a uh, finished uh, one side and. Yeah. This is a killing stone. Uh, Japanese uh, folk story about sort of many years of the no play or theater. So there was a uh, nine tailed fox. They, she had such power to mm -hmm. do not bad things to <laughs> many way. Emperor, uh, one of the favorite lady, she was Lady Tamamo. Mm -hmm. She had <laughs> nine fox. She's nine a cat, yeah. Then she was beauty, the irresistible, but one day uh, someone found that she wasn't a lady, she had something else. <laughs> then she just so angry about that she, then a uh, famous archer, Miura no Yoshisuke, Miura. <laughs> Miura Yoshisuke, killed, shot, and then she's so angry about it. The, uh, then after her anger, spirit, come to the stone, then that stone was still existing about uh, Fukushima prefecture. But actually, that's what uh, spring, have about sulfur gas. Therefore, you're going to nearby, take your gas, you're dying. Therefore, many years ago, people don't know that gas. Therefore, don't go that stone, that, that killing stone. That is also make a lot of story. The other that the folk story come together. There's a king some Basho visit there. That lots of uh, insects or animals they die. 
dead, dead body there. Well, this is a part of the texture of the um, killing stone. This is a part of it. And that's the clothes. We have also, the, the, also uh, could it back of a fast one? This is sort of a, uh, her eyeball, last <laughs> chance she could anger <laughs> like this. Then she died. <laughs> that time, that her, she reflects also the nature behind her eyeball. That's the other side of the image. Mm -hmm. That's her soul. Yeah, this is her soul. Last chance to. <laughs> yeah, next one, please. Well, this is uh, other bunch uh, of very famous haiku. Uh, this is a uh, middle age has a huge battle. Then a lot of people, well, soldier, uh, try to uh, well, take all country on the control, but they failed. Then there is a bunch of visited that area that only green, summer green grass, so but green, very fresh green only left it there. Therefore, I thought this may be interesting thing, the green grass, but see the sky high, but the sort of power, the sort of ambition that squeezes the dark in the sky, there's also part of the uh, bottom, so about a broken <coughs> sword. That is my image, that is the other side. But this is used about, hold on, this is used a uh, green uh, patination. This is used about, I think, sulfur uh, sort of chemical. This one, uh, that one, uh, previous one called hot uh, used flame. This one called patination. You just uh, put on cold chemical. They leave it overnight. Then want to leave it <laughs> other night. Then uh, color changing, uh, green part of it expanded. Then you happy about it, just covered wax. Then chemical uh, react stop. So this is I sort of so screaming in the sky. There's the ambition. This is a uh, partial uh, <laughs> Mount Chokai when he, he visit uh, Chokai because the oh this is do you want me to read the English yeah? yes at first glance this beautiful bay looks very like Matsushima but in reality they are completely different. Matsushima's face is smiling, but Kisagata seems to hold back, lonely, sad, the landscape of a troubled mind. <coughs> and and uh, the thing about Mount Chokai is that it's where Isa grew up, and he used to work on Mount Chokai, which is a volcano, uh, during his summer holidays, carrying hikers' lunches and stuff like that for pocket money. Um, and uh, it did have a troubled mind, and it, ex it erupted 100 years after Basha's visit. And, and so we wrote together a sort of bit about what happened uh, after uh, Basha had been, and, and how right he was about the troubled mind. 100 years after Basha's visit, Mount Chokai erupted. Kisakata Bay shook itself and rose above the sea. It became a rich new land for rice paddies. Islands slipped into the water like otters leaving their backs as hills. It became the idea of a bay that is even more beautiful because it has gone. All its reflections, its teeming fish. Then one day, when you were young, Mount Chokai woke up again, burped a vast belly egg of ash into the sky. Your mother held her breath. Birds shrieked, fire ladder <coughs> ladders rattled in the rafters. You could taste the fear on your tongue and your brother complained bitterly when sweet fish disappeared from the rivers. Uh, this is, uh, I made uh, this uh, to travel mind uh, sort of landscape made uh, bronze. And that uh, actually mountain is a tiny bottom that you can see like this. That's all image sort of from mind air is sort of feeling. I maybe this is sort of that kind of a face, maybe kind of present. Then this is a, this image and outside when uh, Basho and Sora 
visited uh, that uh, Kisakata Bay, that um, um, when he arrived, there was very windy, stormy, and lots of rain. Therefore, couldn't see any uh, Mount Chokai. Uh, but following the day, beautiful sky, sunny, fresh, then uh, take boat to went to see the uh, center of the bay. But that time, image I just hear to the outside. Then, uh, after, exactly after 105 years later, Russia visit, then uh, Kisakata, uh, Manchokai, they erupted. Then all uh, were preceded that uh, um, high boom. But that it, it happened, then all uh, landscape, uh, I never see, but I really despair, but covered with ash. But this, I, I felt like uh, Japanese, uh, but many still not believe, every object has a kind of spirit or feeling. Then uh, what Ash Demon was inside the uh, volcano, maybe he wanted to get out, get out. But then actually get out, he just look. He too late, they all destroy that beautiful landscape. That's I, I, I maybe that's quite interesting that he, Try don't touch uh, his feet in the ground. Therefore, like the hand, like they see. <laughs> that is uh, my first uh, ash demon. But still, he sees something beautiful things. He neglected, neglected to or why, why I did it. That is the image. This painting is about two parts and also uh, eight feet, no, eight feet and twelve feet. No. And it looks fantastic in the, in the gallery. <laughs> it really does, doesn't it? Yeah. And also, this one, I just take some kind of feeling. It's of a Japanese temple has sliding doors for the uh, mm. painting. I take something. And then, also, uh, this is a, a part of the uh, in the Oxford uh, Glass Tank uh, uh, Gallery. This altogether kind of uh, this tatami, two tatami, this uh, part is uh, installation is called temple. The behind the, my choreography is the Basho's uh, narrow oak, uh, first page of the sixth line. Um, could you read something in English? Yeah. Months and days are eternal travelers. The years that hurry past are also on a journey. But it's much more than that, but I don't have the text. Here. Yeah, so then, about, then also, this, uh, here, uh, uh, what, uh, the quick style of uh, uh, Japanese character, uh, character yeah. is I made for three dimensional installation, use Japanese uh, paper. It's the character for, yeah, uh, for wind. 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 And, and what does he say? I should say what he says in the, the sight of the cloud, yeah? Yes, Drifting yes, on yes, the wind. Yes, yeah. So that, that's what he feels like when he sees a cloud drifting on the wind. He feels like traveling. It's an yeah. irresistible feel. Yes. Then uh, I just so quick thought that uh, how, to, how to make what uh, calligraphy to Sri and sculpture. Then I just made a lot of drawing. This uh, one part of it. Then also the maquette. And I made something. Then you can see so how <laughs> This uh, paper, uh, real work is 16 meter uh, long, then sort of uh, 45 centimeter uh, wide. Then and I made this one uh, two different type of uh, uh, Japanese paper. One is Hosho, creased Hosho. The one is, uh, this is a creased Hosho I cut half. This is one meter, 10, me 10 meter long paper. Uh, I bought 20 years ago in the Osaka. <laughs> then I kept it. <laughs> when something comes, I want to use it. Well, this is a really nice uh, texture of paper. Yeah. Then this is what I wrote. And in inside, uh, a mesh, inside, yeah. uh, but very fine mesh, uh, aluminum mesh. Mm -hmm. There also this, uh, but uh, making like this is like I follow exactly a Japanese tradition of obi making. Mm -hmm. So Japanese is obi. 
then and the in, in, interline and other uh, sort of mixed texture, then other top is like nice, beautiful, and uh, public. This is sort of Japanese obi making style I just follow, but they use sort of a lot of uh, working. This is about, uh, in a gallery I work to uh, set up. But it's a gallery, beautiful, you see, it's a huge space. <laughs> <laughs> This is yeah, part of the, and also uh, this uh, one side front, but this is not the front or back. One side has Chris wrote about the poem, then other side about the bad texture, the basic Japanese uh, hosho, Chris the hosho used. Mm -hmm. This is also about the installation is sort of uh, six, almost six meter and four meter width. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Chris. Um, let me just introduce Natalie before she uh, talks about uh, Dotomont. And uh, Natalie Aubert is Professor of French Literature at Oxford Brooks. She's a renowned expert on uh, the work of Marcel Proust, and most recently edited the collection Proust and the Visual in 2012. After co-editing a collection entitled From Art Nouveau to Surrealism, Belgian Modernity in the Making, she published her monograph on the surrealist Belgian poet and painter we're about to hear about, Christian Dutemont, La Conquête du Monde par l'image in 2012. And she's currently working on a monograph entitled Proust and Landscape. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I, I feel really like I'm a bit of a letdown compared with uh, <laughs> Isao, who's a print artist. Um, I'm just going to talk to you about, you know, uh, D'Autremont, uh, because I, I thought it resonated with uh, what Isao is doing. Because uh, there, there, there are lots of things, actually, that, that uh, they, they have in common. Uh, and part, part of it has to do with uh, the love of a certain landscape that has to do with the North. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, because D'Autremont started uh, spending a lot of time in Lapland in the 1950s, so it was really in the north. Um, uh, so it resonates with, uh, obviously, what uh, Isao is doing, and also the theme today, I think you were explaining very well, uh, that any artistic process has to do with some form of translation. Uh, so uh, that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. So, uh, sorry, uh, unlike Isao, I'm going to read a little bit, but uh, hopefully I'm not going to read too much. Uh, just to tell you who uh, was D'Autremont, uh, he was born in 1922, he died in 1979. He's a Belgian uh, poet, as uh, Neil mentioned uh, at the beginning. He was part of the surrealist movement, but he's, he's also known for having, having been the founding member of a group called Cobra, which in itself... Uh, was an acronym for the beginning of the three capitals of the north of Europe, uh, Copenhagen, Brussels, and Amsterdam. So th there's always been a lot of north uh, in, in Dutremont. Um, and uh, what's interesting, and what I'm going to talk about today with Dutremont, is that he's created uh, this form. Uh, so Dutremont originally, if you like, is a, is a poet. Uh, but in 1962, he uh, became very interested uh, in trying to translate uh, his texts, his own texts, into some sort of visual form, and this form he called logogram. Uh, and that you have an example here. Um, and usually they are uh, executed in ink, uh, black ink uh, on, on, on paper. Uh, obviously, th there are some similarities with calligraphy in some ways. We're going to talk about that perhaps a little bit later. Uh, it's mostly, mostly illegible because they are not real letters. Uh, but for him, that was an exploration of what you could do, if you like, with letters uh, when you were moving away from uh, the Western uh, alphabet. So that's uh, how he started. Um, so, before I even go there, uh, in, uh, at the beginning of his uh, career, he met uh, a, a painter, actually, you should uh, perhaps examine Isao, because uh, he too did something about uh, volcanoes. Uh, it's Pierre Alechinsky, who's on the left, 
Uh, Christian Dutromo is on the right. That's a picture of Dutromo when he was uh, young and handsome uh, in Las Vegas, unfortunately. Um, and that's, uh, that's the sort of work that he did with Pierre Halushansky. So Pierre Halushansky was a painter. So they would work together on the same space. So this is a logogram. So you have this kind of calligraphy, which is incredibly spontaneous. But what you have, always, someone in the corner here, obviously, is turned out of all proportion. You can't see the, the letters. But there's a small text, usually written in pencil, in French. And that's, if you like, the translation of what's happening <coughs> here. And of course, what's happening here also speaks to what Aleshansky is doing uh, at the top. So that's that kind of interaction with you know, a real visual artist, the painter Alishansky, and he as a poet. And the way you're doing it on your own, they're doing it together. Uh, actually, perhaps you two, you should perhaps do the same thing you know, on the same sheet of paper, because that's, that's how they worked. Um, and another example of, of Dutremont with Alishansky, so the logo come in the middle with the translation, if you like, the French text here, and Alishansky, you know, sort of uh, adding all sorts of elements uh, with a, you know, um, all sorts of, of forms. Uh, often they have to do with some strange monsters. And again, it's not dissimilar with some of the things that you've done. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't make the connection earlier enough, but I should have shown you uh, a reproduction of, of paintings where he does have volcanoes. So that would have been perfect, but perhaps from some other time. Um, so he, again, I, I had mentioned uh, they, they worked uh, together in a group called Cobra. Uh, and one, one of the main characteristics of this group was that uh, it was essentially <coughs> a, a group made up of, of uh, visual artists, painters, but also poets. Uh, and often they worked together. So someone, a, a painter here is Asger Jong, uh, a Danish painter, uh, would draw some sort of form, and then Dutronon spontaneously would uh, answer, you know, uh, to what Asger Jong was creating visually with uh, writing in the painting itself. Uh, and again, uh, I chose this one deliberately because I thought it was not unlike something that you've done. Uh, that's very much the kind of uh, sort of um, imagining <coughs> that they had. That was one of the main characteristics of Koha. They painted uh, like that. And again, it's again Alishansky, and you can see the shapes the way uh, the, there's a kind of dialogue with the center and the margins. Uh, and again, it's, uh, it's, it's all about an, an interpretation of um, you know, a, a number of, of questions that they are asking about the primary forces, if you like. So again, not unlike what you do. This, I'm just giving you a sample of the type of paint, uh, works that the painters in the group were making. So Karel Appel, uh, who was Dutch. Uh, again, Appel, with a lot more color. Uh, you have to understand that's a group that was created just after the Second World War, so where they were desperate to add colour. So there's an awful lot of colour in every sort of single work by Cobra. Uh, this one I thought was interesting for you, uh, Isao, because he is actually uh, a, a sculptor, uh, and that's what he does. Ah. And I thought, mm -hmm. in some ways, uh, it was probably talking to what you you are doing. So. Okay, that, that's what's, uh, sorry, that's a uh, <laughs> shameful uh, 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 publicity for what I'm doing. Um, so th this friendship with uh, uh, Aleshansky uh, is, is very significant. I'm, I'm coming back slightly so that you are clear about who Aleshansky is. So that's uh, Aleshansky and Dutromo together. Because Aleshansky himself was very interested in uh, Japanese calligraphy. Mm -hmm. And in 1955, actually, he went to Japan uh, to study under a master calligrapher. Uh, and he even made uh, a film uh, about it. Um, and of course, uh, th this th dimension uh, of experimentation for Western artists. You know, uh, I was telling you earlier, well, before we came in the room, that the French are totally in love uh, with Japan. I, mean, I, I think I can speak for the Belgians as well. I'm sure they're <laughs> interested in Japan as well. Uh, th there was really, really an interest. Uh, there still is a uh, very strong interest uh, in, in that kind of interconnection, East-West encounter. 
uh, uh, in their art, uh, with, and that certainly carries on today. So what's uh, of interest uh, today, especially uh, talking specifically more about Dautremont, uh, is that um, when you worked in proximity with painters, and don't forget that Dautremont is actually a poet, uh, is really interested in the spontaneity of the response. Uh, um, they are in a certain situation. They paint standing off, uh, with, uh, you know, but over the painter, which is usually on the floor. Uh, and it's a game. Uh, well, if you like, the body is, is usually engaged. And it's a game, it's a play, it's an interplay be be between the two uh, artists. Um, and. It's because, in part, the artists uh, that were part of that Cobra group uh, were against any kind of intellectualization and against rationalization, against, in some ways, uh, any form of, uh, you know, sort of representation. Uh, they were all about uh, spontaneity, that's what they're interested in. And experimentation uh, was very much the key word for the, for the Cobra artists. Um, and that's why, uh, if you, we go to Dautremont himself, again, I'm bearing in mind that he's a poet, it's an unusual kind of a position. Uh, that's how he was making uh, his, um, his, uh, his logograms, just standing up like that, when, when he was working uh, on his own. And um, what he discovered through his practice of the logogram uh, uh, is that form in poetry, as in painting, resides in, the, in its internal deployment principle. Uh, it's all about movement, it's all about reaction. Um, and form is precisely what renders things visible. And of course, as a poet, it's very important because you move away from the word, you move towards the letter, and then once you're at the letter rather than the word, you can move away uh, towards the visibility, if you like, the form of, of the letter itself. And in some ways, the logogram is supposed to be a more direct access, if you like, to uh, the origins of meaning. Um, and he was struck when he was little, he says that in that book called Kras, with a lovely logogram on the, on, the, on the front. When I was little, I realized that nature sometimes writes. For example, I read the letters formed by the wind in high grasses, and I find that really interesting that that was grass that you were doing with your sculptures, sculpture, sculpture as well. And this discovery uh, struck me. So this discovery uh, strikes him, but uh, how can he reconcile this ability of form to transform itself with the necessity for him as a poet to produce meaning, because that's the essence of the work of a poet. So two things happen here, uh, and um, first in 1943 he married a woman who was um, Eurasian, uh, and uh, so he began, he began to be really interested in Chinese, first of all, uh, culture, and he sort of started to work on Chinese calligraphy. Then later on in 1950, and that's the very important moment in, in his life, um, he realizes that that's a little piece of paper that he wrote when he was on a train, so it's a bit shaky. And he realized that uh, looking at this sheet of paper, uh, that if he held it vertically and looking through the sheet of paper, so he realized that in fact uh, his handwriting looked vaguely Chinese. <laughs> well, that's what I thought. It was Belgian after all. So. <laughs> what did you know? Uh, but anyway, uh, obviously he didn't mean it in any kind of literal s sense. Here, Chinese uh, meant for him to um, uh, to have discovered, if you like, some sort of unfamiliar script, uh, which foregrounds the materiality of writing for a Western reader. That's what he interested him at the time, uh, and and the essay carries on because that, that uh, is part of a text where he explains this discovery um, and he suggests <coughs> that uh, pictorial elements can often be more legible than words. So, you know, from that moment of discovery, uh, obviously the, there is still some time uh, to mature this, this 
discovery because the logo Khan were hardly discovered, or Yang started doing, making logo Khan in 62, so 12 years later. But eventually, this original discovery will lead him to uh, make uh, logo Khan. So, um, it's just to show you, yes, that his so called Chinese does indeed, you know, look in some ways uh, like uh, what is called sometimes a grass script. Uh, so he's not all that far off the mark. Um, so these are logograms. So I'm just going to give you some examples uh, of what they are. They, they, they are quite diverse. But, you know, don't, don't forget what I was saying. You will always have that kind of, you know, oriental, if you want, uh, calligraphy. But there's always a text at the bottom. Huh? Um, but in terms of, of form, they're, they're often quite different. And it's made, you know, thousands. Uh, so in fact, you can make this quite quickly, as you say. Uh, so, um, so what they, are, they oh, usually um, they can be composed uh, on uh, either on paper or canvas. Um, these logo hands they're usually around 60 centimeters by 80 centimeters. Uh, the main component is a, a, a collection of uh, brush strokes, uh, which constitute a kind of writing, at time filling the whole space, at time centered and varies, often in black ink ink on white paper, but sometimes also in color, as we've seen. Um, this, um, the important information about the logo card is that it has two components. It cannot just be the top or the bottom. To be a logo card, you have to have both. So these two components are very important. And that he calls a text. Uh, you know, he, he doesn't consider himself as uh, a painter. He is a poet. Uh, so that's a text. In this text, text uh, non pré établi, as it says in French, and, uh, which can be you know, translated as spontaneous text. Uh, it's just, you know, feeling like that, a, a, a sort of beautiful sort of movement. Uh, and the way he was doing it, you know, he would, where you see him in his loft, uh, because it, it was never rich, autrement. Um, he, he lived in an old people's home. Uh, that was his choice, though it has to be said. But on, in the loft of that old people's home uh, in, in, in the suburbs of Brussels, he had this room, which was the studio. But otherwise, you know, two uh, uh, floors uh, down, he had his bedroom. And when suddenly he thought he wanted to do a logo crown, he would quickly go up and he would, you know, uh, do that uh, as quickly as he could. That that, that was uh, absolutely the key. The key. So. In some ways, if you like, you can say, you can consider that the second half of the, the, the logo card, <coughs> this one or the other one where it's written underneath, this is, in some ways, the translation of what's happening here. Okay? Um, but this time, the text is handwritten, very legible, as you can see, very nice handwriting. Um, and of course, because of that, you can see the connection with calligraphy, possibly. Uh, and, and he is perfectly aware of that. Huh? Um, there's no doubt about that. I'm not quite sure how, how much time I have, so I had a little sort of paragraph on calligraphy, so I'm not going to go about that. What I found really interesting, but you know, a lot can be said <laughs> about connections with various uh, practices of calligraphy, um, uh, you know, wh which are shared, you know, by J Japanese or Chinese writing. Uh, th there's this idea that they must never be never be altered or retraced uh, afterwards. So, so potentially, if you have questions about that, I'm more than happy to answer. But uh, I'm going to move on because I think in a way it resonates with what uh, Isao is doing. Um, <coughs> I'm going to move on to uh, what d'autres mots called les logonèges. Uh, so, as I said uh, at the beginning, in 1956, from 1956 and uh, until the end of his life, although he was uh, not in very good health by the end of his world, uh, life, he spent a lot of time in Lapland, 
uh, particularly in the winter. Uh, and he discovered uh, that in some ways uh, he could create the same sort of principle same sort of poems, if you like, but uh, you know, they temporary necessarily uh, in the snow. Um, so well, this one is unusual uh, because obviously it's just written. There's no logogram here. There's just a trace of a uh, uh, walking in the snow. Uh, I only find this interesting because it's white on black, and of course it symbolizes the white sheet of paper for uh, the poet and the black of the ink. Uh, but obviously, there's no doubt that the snow for him is uh, in the like a sheet of paper. This one uh, is uh, incredibly ambitious because most of the time, uh, in fact, uh, they're very small, they're very you know basic, uh, just a little stick, uh, and they're not as as uh, elaborate by necessity because, uh, as as the ones he does in paper. Uh, it, was, it was really funny because it, you know, it was totally ill-equipped to be La Plan in the half of the winter, but that's, that's how he wanted to be, and that's how he, he did it. And what's interesting here is that the st snowy natural landscape, uh, uh, its emptiness, uh, its topography, and there's a lovely picture here <coughs> of um, a, a, a landscape. Um, uh, you know, and, and the rarefied, rarefied vegetation uh, offered him, obviously, possibilities to reflect on the interaction between landscape and vision. And that, I move away slightly from his house and go back to Basho, because that's exactly what's happening. Uh, a, a lot of what Basho was doing was to interact with the landscape. And, and Dautremont, instinctively, if you like, realizes that when you're in the landscape and if you're a poet there are various ways to answer uh, to respond to what's happening and that is you know his own uh, attempt um, and tracing uh, is uh, logogram or logonege uh, directly you know into the landscape are for him obviously uh, a way to connect in a very different way uh, uh, with reality, if you like, that's another way for him to reflect on the idea of translation. Uh, the poetic act becomes the translation, which is then corporeal, material, as well as symbolic. Uh, uh, that's the translation of an experience. It's a metaphor in some ways, which approaches the real as closely as possible, as opposed to putting it at a distance uh, in search of the perfect symbol that you know uh, you would uh, sometimes do if you're a poet. So there is a kind of really the dream, at least, or the ambition of a direct connection with uh, the experience of the real. Um, uniquely, this is rare for an artist whose medium is the word. Of course, uh, he tackled what artists like Isao know very well. That is to say, the translation of an experience or an emotion into uh, the materiality of a form. And the connection between Dautremont and Basho is also that the Japanese master, uh, and in many ways that's the reason why Basho is so still you know, admired, including by modern poets today, uh, uh, Basho broke with the tradition of uh, the stylized geography by going on the road. Uh, uh, by writing descriptions uh, of the places through which he passed, uh, uh, interspacing these uh, descriptions with haiku. So, in some ways, and I'm going to finish on that, uh, d'autrement haiku are his logogram, um, uh, his poems and his logograms that he produced in his deep north, huh? it seems that everybody has a deep north, uh, uh, you know, are precisely uh, this attempt uh, to translate the experience, uh, all the while trying to retain the materiality uh, of, of, um, of the inscription, if you like. Uh, like the Japanese poet three centuries earlier, it was his use of nature that was revolutionary and allowed him to pioneer a form which remains unique today. Um, if, if you like, uh, in some ways, Dautremont uh, invented uh, 
uh, land art uh, because it was not, uh, well, at least in the modern age, if you like, um, invented uh, yet. So the idea of uh, the high cookie, which must be composed in an instant, and Basho says like cutting a watermelon or biting a pear, which again, of course, is a fantastic image, uh, is definitely something that uh, D'Autremont himself tried to retain in the spontaneity of the gesture in the logogram. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, that's what he was attempting uh, in, in his own way uh, here. And he too you know, uh, wrote prose poems uh, besides this to, uh, to develop, to meditate a little bit more on uh, connection with the landscape. But essentially, I think that what he was trying to do is uh, very close to what Bachelor was doing, and in some ways, quite close to what Isao is doing today. Uh, that's what I want to say.